Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm really excited about this one and I've dragged Nina along with me because she's excited too. Nina, how are you and uh, what are we doing today? Oh, very good. Thank you very much. So today we are we're going to take a look at uh, the the ever intriguing, fascinating, and challenging story of the Franklin Expedition, and we're doing that today because we're talking to uh, Ernest Coleman, who is a former naval man, polar adventurer, and a historian who's written twenty two books. Now I'm absolutely jealous, including Khaki Jack, the Royal Navy Division of the First World War, the intriguingly titled The Pig War. But today he's here to talk to us about his newest book, No Earthly Pole, The Search for the Truth About the Franklin Expedition, 1845. Welcome, welcome, sir. Hello, and thank you for inviting me. We're delighted to have you today. So um, uh, Chris and I had a bit of a, well, we, we had a bit of a wrestling match on this one, and we've agreed that with all the questions that we have, that we're going to take turns asking you. Um while I'm a 19th century historian, I am not a I'm not an expert on polar history, but it has been something I've been fascinated with for quite a while. And of course, the the thing and the question which occupied so much of the latter part of the 19th century, well into the 20th, and here we are in the 21st, is the story of the Franklin expedition and what actually happened. So um what what got you interested in in the expedition in the first place? Well, one of my last jobs in the Navy was <clears throat> to, uh, as a recruiting officer for Lincolnshire. So while I was there, and I actually live in Lincolnshire uh, now, whilst I was there, I thought, um, it's too much RAF, you know, Royal Air mm-hmm. Force all over the place. Um, and yet yeah, we've got a fine naval history and great names like um, Flinders, Bass, Banks, um, and of course, uh, Franklin, the, the leading four, if you like, or John Smith, who brought po- Pocahontas over, comes from there. And so I wrote a book, and uh, it was my very first book called The History of the Navy in Lincolnshire. Right. And the more I looked into Franklin, the more I kept thinking, there's something odd here. You know, he just disappeared. And up until Scott, uh, expedition, of course, to the Antarctic, uh, people always considered the Franklin expedition as the one big uh, mystery and naval disaster, if you like. Right. So I decided to look further and further into it, and then I managed to persuade the Admiralty to uh, let me go up there and have a look. Had you had any um, Arctic experience prior to this i know you're you know you you were a, a naval man for more than 30 years and so you know you've been on all manner of different uh you know expeditions different craft submarine etc cetera, etc cetera. had you been to the arctic before you uh, before you decided this was a topic that you wanted to um, to investigate uh, is, is this just a <clears throat> sort of cheapskate answer this is <laughs> Uh, before, when I was 16, I was on the Art Royal aircraft carrier. Right. And right. we did uh, Arctic trials or ice trials, or what have you, you choose to call them, um, up into the Davis Straits. Okay. And um, uh, I, I thought it was spectacular because you used to have a thing called Arctic sea smoke. Now, oh. that's, that means there's a mist all over all the water, as far as you can see. And so you appear to be sailing through um, a cloud. Oh, gosh. And uh, I, because I was slightly naughty on one occasion, I was sentenced <laughs> to uh, two hours extra work. And uh, I was sent up to chip the ice off one of the radar uh, domes. Yes. And it was a wonderful sensation. But that uh, was the only experience I'd had before. Oh, gosh. 
the main purpose of the expedition was to find the Northwest Passage. But why is it so important and why is Britain and the Royal Navy trying to secure it? I'm not so sure about the word secure. When Franklin set off, he was pointed out this was a, an achievement for humanity, if they could do it, because to get to, um, if you went westwards and uh, you wanted to reach the Pacific and, and uh, further on, it's a long way down, right way down, past uh, Cape of Good Hope, uh, sorry, um, uh, the tip of, uh, the southern tip of South America. Whereas if we could go from the north and across the top of uh, Canada and that, uh, um, it would make a terrific trading route. Something interestingly enough that still applies today. Um, yeah. It would make a great trading uh, uh, route. And of course it would be open to everybody. That was the point. If the, if the Royal Navy discovered it, then great. But we, we weren't going to put customs barriers on it or anything. <laughs> Excellent. In your expedition north, what and and I'm so glad you told us of the you know sort of your your first encounter um, uh, and and the particular punishment which meant you were spending a, a great deal of time outside chipping ice yeah. um, from from the expeditions because this was this project was multiple expeditions um, it wasn't just one and done what um, what what did you find the region was like in terms of just climate, in terms of ability to travel and so on and so forth? Well, I, prior to that, I'd never been uh, into the Arctic in the dead of winter. I, I, I actually have since. And the, the Arctic in winter is beautiful. There's, mm. there's no question about that. But very unfriendly. Mm. Mm. Uh, also... Uh, you need to go in the summer if you're going to do any research because you need the snow to keep, get clear off the land. The, 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 most of the water is going to stay frozen, mm -hmm. but you you can use the land as a, a means and the ice if, if you, you have to. But if you're looking for something, you need it cleared, uh, and that's what it was. And it very quickly came to, to me that the Arctic in summer... Is, can be very unpleasant. Hmm. Um, you've got your polar bears that, that that are a threat when you're home because they think you're an upright seal, and they, you know, <laughs> if you're not careful, uh, you don't want to end your day look, looking through the rear end of a polar bear. Pretty much, yeah. yeah pretty much, yes. Um, and it can be unfriendly, just the, the same. But then again. That's just one of life's challenges. Absolutely. And of course, you know, it, nowadays, um, the sort of equipment that we might have access to is, is, you know, incredibly different in terms of durability, in terms of design. In, in terms of your travels, did you, did you, I mean, obviously, in order to stay safe, you had to, you had to use 20th century technology. But um, did you... Were you able to sort of uh, get a grasp, do you think, of what it would have been like for Franklin and his men in, the, you know, 1845 to, uh, to try to travel in that area uh, without access to the kinds of, you know, things that we have? Yeah, pretty much the same, because uh, all I had was a tent, and mm -hmm. uh, that, that, was, that was it. In bad conditions, it was pretty awful, particularly wind, because wind tended to flatten the tent. But, of course. Uh, of course. Uh, uh, you, you've got that. And if you're really unfortunate, as I was on a few occasions, you can get water dripping through uh, the holes onto your sleeping bag, which is oh, right. yeah. quite annoying, actually. <laughs> but, but I set up... Um, I shall stick with my solo expedition. That was the most interesting one. Mm. Uh, the, the reason it's more advantage to be on your own is that even if there's two of you, the chap who's didn't share in the tent with you might have had a bad night's sleep, and then right. you're ready to go. The, and this happened on a few occasions. Yeah, you've got to wait for him to wake up and uh, want to go. Right. So, uh, of course, don't forget it's 24 hours daylight. Yes. Um, so I decided to set off from the camp I had, uh, had 
and walk as far north as possible onto King William Island, which is one of the central island that's involved in all this. And I wanted to see where Franklin's ships had got stuck. So I did quite a lot of walking. Um, I was armed because um, you really can't go up there with some means of defence if, if the polar bears decide. Of course. And I saw polar bears, and uh, uh, they, I'm probably the wrong shape or something. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, thankfully. And um, uh, they didn't, uh, only on one occasion uh, did they come for, for us, and luckily we were just about to board a helicopter. But I'll, this, I'll go back to the solo one. It was about 40 miles, and I had to do it in two days. Uh, and I thought, well, this is just the way they would have done it. So <laughs> on their feet, get going. It's right. not a very smooth passage. The, the surface of the ground is fractured rocks. And uh, that's why occasionally you take to the ice, because right. the ice can be. Um, but but it, was, it was just a, an interesting exercise. And I found out that uh, I didn't. Something I didn't know is that when it gets very cold, the propane doesn't work. Oh so God! I couldn't eat anything. There was nothing to put. But then again, uh, God built me like this, and I'm <laughs> oh, <that's>, oh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That gosh, there's an unexpected development for you. Yeah. Did, did you have any problems with navigation? I know that Franklin's crew suffered from this. A ship's compasses couldn't pick up north because it's constantly shifting. Did you have any problems with that? Uh, no, because compasses weren't a great deal. Uh, I always used to think my compass pointed to the rifle. It's the first bit of metal <laughs> that it could, you know, point at. Right. Um, no, the navigation wasn't really difficult because you're walking up. I, I always kept the coast about a mile from where I was walking. And mm -hmm. if you keep the coast in sight, then uh, it's not a problem. Right. Yes. Some of the areas are, but my hated favourite place was a place called Wall Bay. Mm. And in summer, it's notorious that there seems to be a fog hangs over that. Always. Right. So, again, I got closer to the shore so for, for that. But it was very strange. It was fog like I'd never known before. It was, it was like being in your own sort of little cave that mm. you were moving forward and your, your visibility was a matter of just a few yards. Gosh. So yeah. you, uh, so I, I plodded on through that, quite concerned that a, a polar bear would, would be perfect to, to spring right. out at you. Absolutely. They, they obviously didn't fancy me, so uh, but no, nothing <laughs> happened. And coming out the other side, generally anyone um, capable of a decent walk could, could manage it. There's nothing right. particularly special about that. Right. So um, go, going back to the expedition, um, what kind of man was Sir John Franklin? And um, was he a good choice to choose to... Hang on, start that again. <laughs> See, it's always me. Um, so what kind of man was Sir John Franklin? And was he a good choice to lead this expedition? I think he was a perfect choice. Um, he was always extremely popular with his men uh, and his leadership. He had a massive experience. Uh, even when, um, uh, as a midshipman, he, did, he took part in Arctic expeditions. When he uh, was made uh, captain, he led two overland expeditions, very, very important ones. And um, he didn't believe in... Uh, they used to call it Franklin's Paradise when he had a ship, was the captain of a ship. And he didn't believe in the kind of punishment that we all know by tradition was meted out to uh, sailors. They didn't ship ice off for, for, for a couple of hours. They got a good... Uh, Cats, uh, cat, you know, taking the cat to punishment. Right. And he didn't believe in that. Uh, also, in his early life, he had a lot of interesting things. He uh, fought alongside Nelson uh, twice at the um, Battle of Copenhagen and, of course, the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, 
Now, he was a very popular man in naval terms. Mm. So those sorts of things, if you're going to take a crew of men into what is essentially the unknown um, and have them over winter, uh, I would imagine, and you know, you can speak to this as a Navy man yourself, that those leadership qualities, the ability to inspire, uh, you know, at this point, um, your men, uh, I would imagine that that would be that would be an important factor in the success of anything that you were doing. Yeah, I I entirely agree. You couldn't have a Captain Bly um, up there. That would work. Uh, Franklin was a good leader. He'd, he'd never failed. He wasn't very good at diplomacy. Uh, he, one time, he was the Lieutenant Governor of Tasmania. Right, right. I remember. And uh, he fell out time and again with the politicians, and the politicians eventually had him removed because he... He didn't like the way they were treating the locals, and uh, his wife built a museum. Uh, you know, they, they did a lot of very, very good work for the benefit of people. And uh, the politicians were saying, more or less, you don't have this business for that. You know, you, you, that's not what you're here for. Right. Um, but uh, I think he was probably very happy to have that opportunity to, uh, to, to lead the expedition. He'd been to the Arctic previously as well, hadn't he? Uh, well, yes, he had, he had two massive overland expeditions. Um, one to, well, it was the Mackenzie River, and the other one, the name escapes me for the moment, but, uh, uh, oh, the Copper, uh, Copper Mine River. Yeah. And um, they were in themselves successful. He had a bit of rotten luck because he had some poor condition. He was supposed to meet another ship on the uh, west side, uh, west corner, if you like, of uh, North America, mainland, and he missed it by 150 miles. Oh, gosh. Now, for that, he had to walk a bit. hundreds and hundreds of miles back. To oh, my goodness, to yes. Get but he, um, he got through, but it was very, very difficult for him, and that showed terrific leadership. Another one of the aspects that has been um, considered in recent studies of, of Franklin's expedition is the way that they were equipped and provisioned. And so, um, what what is your how do you understand um, that particular aspect and how it might have affected or or not affected the outcome in terms of equipment, food? Yeah. yeah. You know, the ships, first of all, they, they, they were experienced ships, if you like. They'd been right. around for a while, and they'd been to the Antarctic, and uh, they were known to be good ice vessels, if you like. But where the uh, state of the art came in was when they put uh, a steam engine on board. Right. I and know. the engine, I think they took the engine from the Greenwich Light Railway. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, one of the sh um, uh, axle shafts would have been attached to a, a, a propeller outside. And uh, they really thought about this because they thought, well, if you can get trapped in the ice. So uh, in the stern, they had what called a, they called a, a, a well. And that's where, if you were going into ice, you could lift the propeller out. Of course, of course. Now, coal was the only fuel they could use. They used it as ballast for a start. That was a good, good, yeah, common sense thing because you could always replace it with with rock and and uh, yes. keep it going. Uh, but um, it didn't work all that well. It was it was a new technology to have uh, right, ships right. with the uh, engines engines in. It was there, and it really wasn't. It didn't have the punch to get you through ice or anything like that. But right. if I can go to food, food is an astonishing story. Half um, of the supply of canned food that. Uh, uh, was supplied to Franklin on the two ships, Terra and Erebus. Um, the, the other half was left in Portsmouth Dockyard because they were finding another ship, you know, supplying other ships with it. Right. 
And guess what they found? When Franklin had gone, he'd lost all communication with him. The stench from the food in Dock, Portsmouth Dockyard was leading to complaints from people who lived around there. Oh, that was right. Absolutely yeah. rotting away. Yeah. Now you've got to say, well, Franklin's got the same thing. Right. And uh, that's why I think it was about 12,000 tank cannons were put on board the mm. two ships. Right. And yet only 600 have been accounted for. Yes. Now, because metal, we've come to this later, metal is so rare in, in the Arctic, it's just a little bit of copper, but, but that's it. That's it. Um, they decided they, they would have only thrown it overboard. But yeah. the thing that they, they had there was, was lead in the cans. There were seals with lead. Just lead seal. was useful for musket balls and a variety of uh, uh, such matters. So that's why on Beach Island, which is where the first evidence was found, right. the, ma the major thing there was a forge. And that's what they did. They got empty cans of, of the, the food uh, um, and then melted the lead from the tins. And uh, it, they're still there today, examples of those, those, those tins. But to, far, to, to be able to trace no more than 600 out of thousands means that they were just dumped, got rid of them as quick as you can. Right. They wouldn't have had to have gone short of food. Um, one of the favourite, uh, killing birds, seabirds and things like that, and then they were hung in the rigging to dry right. out. And, they, they, they were, they, and of course, once they got further south, having gone into the Lancaster Sound and then worked their way through the Arctic, uh, there was... A lot of caribou, and there are musk oxen, and uh, even polar bears. Although polar bears, you have to be careful of because the livers of polar bears are poisoned. Right. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know, yeah. you know that. So, uh, food could survive. It was enough to survive, and it must have been at their time because, frankly, making the decision to carry on. Right. Right. Still, that requires a great deal yes. of extra effort if you're going to hunt and, you know, feed that many men on two ships, which I assume, you know, must have provided quite, quite, quite the challenge for them in terms of survival. And the, the officers those days were all trained in hunting, right? On horseback or, or whatever. Sure. Um, sure. And the animals, as I experienced, they don't quite know if humans are friendly or not. They'll come up to you and stare right. at you. And uh, right. uh, and the, the, the musk ox, I once saw a wonderful sight where they saw me and retreated into a large circle with all the heads <laughs> pointing out. Right, right. Uh, and then I watched as a, on another expedition when uh, a friend of mine, he advanced to the musk ox Whereupon the must ox charged, he turned sensibly and ran off, and immediately the musk ox stopped. <laughs> to waste energy chasing chasing something you can't eat. Exactly, uh, exactly. Interesting, interesting. Circling back to the lead, some of the first artifacts that were discovered were, of course, the graves of Torrington Brain and the local boy to me, Hartnell. Their autopsies revealed that they had high levels of lead in their systems, which some people have argued that lead poisoning could have been a, a major factor to the, the expedition. But it's also quite contentious, isn't it? It's totally and total nonsense. Uh, even to me, as a non-specialist and, and, and that sort of thing, I knew that they lived on water supplied through lead pipes. They dined off pewter plates, which, uh, you know, contains lead. Um, most of them came from towns and cities where they'd grown up with uh, a lead. Uh, it gets murkier, too, because one of the, the expedition that claimed all this, he said to me that what they did with the lead, I didn't know this, but uh, the amount of lead in a human hair varies along its length. Mm. And so what they'd done was cut all the high bits out 
and uh, the one that, that was um, tested. And that led to the, actually they died of pneumonia um, or tuberculosis. That's what mm. they died of. It got even better for me, at least, was when a Canadian university went to Nelson Stockyard in Antigua and dug uh, into a naval cemetery there from the same period. And guess mm. what? <laughs> there was <laughs> lead. exactly the same level of lead in in the uh, the bodies. Mm. Right. So that so that gives us another perspective in terms of how we might think about uh, the physical outcomes and the health outcomes for the sailors. Is if this is you know uh, certainly one one thought about how they might have died, um, but you know causes us to step back and start considering other things that might have happened but but we do know that something must have gone terribly wrong because you know of course they didn't survive and uh, multiple multiple expeditions in, including your own to try to understand what happened what do you think went wrong with the terror and the Erebus what in 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 terms of your own work and your travels there how 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 might you suggest uh, to or, or what do you suggest to your? I mean, I I got a chance to read the book, but I'm not going to give it away. Um, but what what would you suggest to potential readers of the book that they consider uh, the the actual the actual thing that might, things that might have happened to the sailors? Yeah, I if, if we're talking about the the position suddenly where the uh, expedition went wrong was right. very very simple and totally unexpected. Mm. Uh, when they came down Peel Sound, mm -hmm. uh, and they were, it was, it was, they must have been really very cheerful because they were all heading in the right direction. But yeah. then suddenly they hit ice. No big deal. That's what uh, you know expeditions are about. Yeah. They knew that uh, the best thing to do. Well, you've got a choice. You've got to retreat it without, you know, having got that far. They they right. wouldn't wanted to do that. Uh, you got in the ice, the ice builds around you, and you're locked in the ice for the winter. That was fine. Everything went fine, and they did they had their um, what we used to call in my time in the Navy, sort of sods operas and entertainment, <laughs> <laughs> things like that. To get them through, right. there would have been yeah, hunting right. ashore, uh, because you could walk ashore from, right. from ships, no question of that. Uh, they put up um, markers that... Uh, indicated could indicate the the direction of drift and, and sure. so I think it was fine. Then, to their surprise, when summer came, it remained frozen uh -huh. uh, instead of uh, coming through. Again, they thought, well, okay. Well, Franklin said, you know, that uh, oh, I'll stick it out for uh, another year uh, until. And give it a go next year. Now, now this is uh, two years in total of, of being stuck in that, that ice. They would have spent a lot of time ashore. We know there are evidence of camps ashore that uh, mm. uh, this would almost certainly be hunting expeditions. But one thing that they couldn't cater for, I don't believe, and evidence all suggests this, is that the, the you needed some something to fight scurvy with. There right. was lots of lot of greenery or anything, no trees, nothing at all. Right, right, um, right. And scurvy would have been a problem. Then June, the following year, after they got stuck in the second year, Franklin died. Mm. And uh, you know, that's not about you know. We, this is something they could have handled. They, they knew that this was a possible. He was considered an old man at the time. Then he was about yes. fifty-nine, coming sixty. Uh, Good Crozier uh, took over then. Uh, he would. He was an experienced uh, seaman and Arctic uh, uh, had Arctic experience. But then, when they stayed into uh, um, eighteen forty-eight, so this is the, the third year they're in there now. Right. It didn't break up again. Right. And this was suddenly the situation changed dramatically. Also, what are the state of the ships? Because they managed to resist ice pressing on them and, and, and all the rest. They 
probably said, well, look, you know, we're not, we're not going to last another year here. Scurvy, I think, would have been, would have broken out. And it's a, it's a desperate, uh, the threatening disease. Yes. And so they uh, decided that they'd make a, a, a go for it. 105 men landed on that uh, shore. Mm -hmm. uh, we know now, because we believe found the ships, and uh, we know that they secured what we call secured the ships for sea. Mm -hmm. Battened down the hatches, did everything so it'll keep afloat. Uh, if, if, it, if it's not crushed, it will stay uh, afloat. They're made of wood, after all. Um, of course. Yes. And, um, they then, 105 men came ashore and had to tow not over the ice, that people think they did the ice, they went over land. Right. I actually found an unknown camp by Crozier. And it's very, very interesting that there I found the shape of a boat in rocks. And that is clearly where the, they surrounded with the rocks, probably mm -hmm. took the insides out to do repairs and things like that, where it's propped up with these rocks. And then they just pull it off uh, afterwards. If you've got men with scurvy, uh, it's a terrible condition. They, they can hardly eat. Uh, right. the, the jaws swell, the lips swell, the tongue swells. And energy, trying to pull anything or weave on it, it, it debilitating is the, is the way. And yet they had to do it. How much? How much it, it, do you have a sense of of um, how much the the loaded boats, which I assume they're either trying to pull across, and I know there you you spend some time in one of the chapters describing what the surface is like with slabs yeah. yeah. heaving and crossed and so on. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, just to give just to give our listeners a sense, what are we talking about in terms of what something like that might have weighed? Um, distributed among men who are clearly debilitated, yeah, yeah, weak, yeah, perhaps, you know, as you're saying, they're not able to eat frequently, they're ill. Um, the physical challenge must have been tremendous. It absolutely would. Um, we talked about leadership. Um, right. And leadership and teamwork. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody wants to let down anybody else, and they're all going to yeah. give it a try. The boats themselves uh, they would all have been 27 foot whalers. Oh, good a large right. wooden boat, right. yeah. heavily built, simply on on the um, uh, principle that they're going to be operating in ice. Of course. Yeah. So they would have been very heavy. Uh, we're not quite sure um, how many they drag with them. Right. It's probably no more, well, four would have been maximum. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Uh, and they would have done it in relays. You know, sure. sort of the amount they needed to get it moving, right? They will be taken over by a similar amount. It's it, normal organization that, that uh, sure. would have aided them there. And they did a tremendous job. They, they got all the way down to uh, uh, the uh, southwest corner of Prince of Wales Island. We do know that. Franklin sent uh, Lieutenant Gore and Lieutenant DeVoe uh, on an expedition when the ships were still locked in the ice right. to look at the route. Right. Exactly. And they would have said, you can't go over the ice. The ice is the obvious choice because it would slide. It would slide, yeah, exactly. But you've only got to look at the ice in uh, Victoria Sound. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's masses of huge on the road uh on even uh ice the, the size of houses you know great blocks you just couldn't do it right um, so but but the land is relatively uh flat mm -hmm. and so off uh uh they went and that brings us to that bit was erebus bay erebus bay i think what happened no one's really put this before we know that there were remains, in fact, I found some, uh, further to the south. Mm -hmm. So right. they, they, they split what were on the, the division. 
but I'm convinced that the division was not something caused by conflict or anything else. I think it really was that some of the men just couldn't do the job. They couldn't pull the boats anymore. Yeah. Uh, and I like to think what I would have done, and I believe this is what Crozier um, did, was to treat it like a First World War casualty clearing station. Yes. He yeah. said to all the ones who couldn't make it, all right, man, look, here's the thing what we're going to do. We're going to leave you a boat or two boats. And, uh, you know, we'll leave you food, which we know they did, um, which still existed. Le uh, we're going to leave and you will stay here until the ice melts. Now, Gore and DeVoe must have fra uh, found that the bottom bit of uh, the ice was melting during the summers. That's, that's not a big deal. That's the way it works. Even if the top of the you know, straits are thick with ice, right. the bottom bit turns, because you've got the warm Pacific uh, you know, effect. And so having done that, they would have probably left them with um, a few arms uh, and perhaps a couple of volunteers, you know, so we'll look after them, we'll, we'll do this, that, and, and the other. Uh, while we go. And so just hang on here, keep yourself alive, the ice will melt, get your boats on the water, and then head off. They didn't really have much other choice, really, but in um, hindsight, it's always 2020, but was Crozier's plan to head south a, a good idea, considering would, it, would they have been better off to stay with the boat, with uh, Terra and Erebus? There, there were a couple of op uh, options. Uh, Sir John Ross, in one of his expeditions, uh, left a ship uh, across something called the Boothia Peninsula. Mm. Uh, and, but I believe, and I'm not loading this, uh, there are rumours that when did they, Ross abandoned that ship, uh, the natives actually sort of got on board and stripped it and there would be nothing left. So that, that immediately cut your options in about half. You could have tried to retreat, but uh, it was too late once uh, they, when they first met the ice, they could have uh, retreated, but they wouldn't want to do that. And uh, so um, they, co they couldn't move from there with the ships. Uh, I can't think of anything else that was open to them. So faced with this sort of a challenge, um, what can you tell us about Crozier as a leader? I mean, you know, we've, we've spoken at length and you've, you've reminded us of, of Franklin's wealth of experience um, and his Arctic experience. What kind of a leader um, was Crozier, Crozier meant to be? Um, I mean, he's second in command here. He, of course, is going to, you know, one assumes step up and was ready to step up into such a leadership position if needs be. Yeah, I, I think uh, I, I've met one of his um, descendants, actually. Oh, you did? That's yeah, right. Yeah, I remember yeah. you mentioned that in the book, yes. And, and he'd got the middle name, Rawdon, Rawdon Crozier. Right. Uh, uh, to have got to be a captain in the Navy, you have to have certain skills because you're going to be a danger elsewhere. elsewhere. Right. Uh, there, there's decades and centuries even of experience of who's good and who's the one to take off. I can't think of any reason why Crozier, who's a good seaman, we know, we know he, he could handle ships, if he can handle ships, he has to be able to handle men. Right. Um, and I, I, I've never come across any complaints about Crozier. Um, and I, I think he was certainly adequate, even if he might not have been brilliant, but he was, yeah. he was good enough. And to persuade his men that we're going to depart these, you know, leave these ships, get ashore, and he wasn't using methods of uh, threats and disciplinary uh, right. punishments right. to do it. Just wouldn't work. You know, they wouldn't uh, they wouldn't have allowed it. And they were acting as teams when they were dragging those boats. The boats wouldn't have moved if they hadn't. Right. All this points to the fact that 
I believe that Crozy was a very good leader. What kind of relics have been left behind? Because unlike other shipwrecks and things where um, in more populated areas where bits go missing and people find them all the time, <laughs> there's not many people traipsing around the Arctic lifting things. And um, they keep find, I know they keep finding odds and sods. Uh, well, we, we have found, or, or the ships have been found, uh, Erebus in uh, Queen Maud Gulf, again, which is to the south of that ice. That they have to, so it has clearly drifted right the way through into Queen Maud Gulf. Mm -hmm. And then, a uh, rather odd one, uh, the, te the Terror uh, drifted against the, the um, tide, if, if you like, uh, the, the flow of the water. Uh, and drifted into what had, you know, this for the chances, what previously known as Terra Bay. <laughs> One yeah, of the things. Terror. And, yeah. and Terra Bay, uh, sorry, the Terra itself uh, is in a very good condition and it displays all the bits of our, our ideas about we've got to secure for sea. Right. Bat matches and, and close all the doors. Right. everything uh, to be ready to go interesting it's um, like a sort of marvelous thing to find yeah yeah and you found um in addition to what you mentioned um earlier in in the podcast um you know a section of rock which which um you know may have supported a boat for repairs you yes. i think you you mentioned in your book that you found one or two other relics that you you are um, convinced are related to the Franklin expedition. Can, uh, can you tell us, a, tell us a little bit about those? I hope I haven't over-egged it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, there, was, really, I remember, there was at least it's, one it's, that, it's, that I know yeah, you It's quite, quite a um, One of the maps showing um, where the, the route that um, Franklin's men took, mm -hmm. um, I think, has been copied and turned the wrong way round. I mentioned this in the book. Yeah. Because it matches a particular area on the way south. Right. Uh, what if you turn it turn it round? I went to visit that and the very, very strange, and I, I, I must admit, it made me almost jump out of my skin. Oh god. And I came down and I found uh, a shape of an arrow made of rocks pointing to this spot. Oh, yeah. Wow. So I I went along the beach there, climbed up uh, one of these eskers, these eskers of sort of inland beaches. Right. And there were six row, uh, a row of six, what just looked like graves. Interesting. Mm. Yeah. And uh, uh, no one's, the, the, the Canadians um, don't see, they don't really want, it's a bit political now. They don't want to do too much up there because of their own political problems they've got. Right. Um, right. But th th they were a shock just to see that. Um, I, the only thing of any tiniest piece of consequence was walking along a beach uh, within Lady Franklin Bay and yes. coming across a toggle. And a wooden hand carved toggle, which were exactly the type that you use on sledge harnesses. Mm. Um, yeah. And uh, drag that. So that I, I brought that back and gave it to the Canadians at Yellowknife, and there it's in their museum and um, whatever. Um, the only other one, particularly, I wasn't very well. And in a tent, and I was in this spot for two days at least, hoping for changing conditions of the weather as much as anything. Yeah. And I thought I'd have a walk around. Well, just behind me was a slope, and I went up this slope, and that's where I found cairns, that shape of the boat, and everything. Right. So I have. It's not, this is not official, but I, <laughs> I call it uh, Camp Crozier. Because uh, you know, and you could see they built cairns that could be seen from the north, so that people coming after you. And I bet, and uh, what part of the system would have been sort of scouts to go ahead 
to to find a place to 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 rest and yeah. um, it's on the edge of seal northern edge of seal bay another bay yeah right um i can't say i came away with anything else Mm-hmm. in material terms right uh, apart from that Phil, those are, that's it's quite interesting and um you know again causes us to return to the larger question of you know of what happened where did the men go and you know um there there is of course and and you you discuss this in the book um there is a belief from the inuit oral tradition um, and an analysis of bones, which suggests the possibility of cannibalism. And I know you 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 deal with that pretty straightforwardly in the book, but perhaps for the podcast listeners, um, you know, you could just quickly touch on. on uh, um, it's yeah. very murky, very very murky. This is. There was a chap who was a um, Hudson Bay employee, Dr. John Ray. Right. Yeah. Yes. Who seems to have had a pathological hatred of the native. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> and I can pinpoint it. Um, during the Franklin searches, two naval officers were sent south to, to get a message to the Admiralty that where, where the different ships were. And uh, they turned up at Ray's fort. You know, where, where he, he was in charge of this sort of little district. Right. And uh, he was a bit put out at the start. You know, where did you come from? And, you know, he's not actually invited here. Um, but it got worse because they were there for about two months. They couldn't move out. Oh, my. Called them self sufficient donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he wrote this down. Now, one of them was Lieutenant Hoover. He uh, went and sort of told to Ray that he was writing a book about his experiences. And um, uh, he said, oh, I was talking to some of uh, your your team and you've had cannibalism here. Interesting. And Ray said, first denied it, and then he said, well, I don't want you to write about it, Okay. Nobody else knows. Let's keep it quiet. Mm. Uh, so he had this experience. When he um, went north on another, to try and find the Northwest Passage for right. himself and the Hudson Bay Company, he uh, met the Netzelik tribe. The Netzelik tribe are notorious. They... Um, Drove, uh, driven, they're a very aggressive tri- tribe. They've driven all other tribes back. There's a lot of research done into this. They took over this part of King William Island, exactly the same place that um, uh, Franklin's, that they really once had difficulty going any further with scurvy and all the rest of it. He knew that the um, Inuit had a tradition actually of cannibalism. And you can understand why, you know, Granny, not she's not helping out, so she might make a nice swiggle to get us through the next bit. Yeah. Uh, this is not at all uh, unusual. So I'm convinced that Ray sort of fed them information, and, or, or not information, but uh, tales of uh, cannibalism. This went in, he pr- reproduced it later as their idea, not his idea. And that was a, a, a real insult to those men. Mm. And then the, uh, lately, uh, bones were looked at, and they these cut marks on them. And they all said, oh, yes, obviously, this is quite clearly um, cannibalism. In fact, it wasn't. They're all signs. Uh, I've gone to Saw York to look at bones there from battlefields and, and whatever. And just the same, exactly the same. And they've got most of the um, cuts are on the hands, on the remains of the hands. That's someone defending themselves. The idea that um, cannibalism should be bowled out straight away 
the only route way could work was if they were attacked by the native, by the Netzelik, because the Netzelik thought all their birthdays had come at once. It was all these resources, you know, metal, wooden, large wooden boats, all sorts of things that they just couldn't get their hands on anywhere else. Uh, it was an easy target. Then the next thing they came out with and said was, ah, well, clearly wrong. Um, the Netzelik tribe are actually a, a Stone Age people. All their tools are made of slate and, um, you know, stones mount, uh, mounted as weapons or whatever. Which is nonsense because uh, Ross, again, um, John Ross, abandoned two ships in the Netzelik area. One with mm. the Victory and the Cruisenstern. Uh, and you can still there go there today and see great big cogwheels made of metal. The Netzelik had absolute access to metal they'd never had before. And there's no doubt about it that these poor men were hacked down and killed. There was also a suggestion that, because there was a lot of damage to finger bones found, that they would have been cut off to frostbite. For example, uh, Ranulph Fiennes cut the end of his fingers yes, off. Yes, that's right, yes, yes. But, um, there was a suggestion that, because there were a lot of finger bones found, that it had actually been the hip surgeons removing frostbitten limbs. Yeah, but other bones are on the long limbs. Mm. Now, uh, I, I have suggested, and everyone agrees from these... Uh, uh, who's been up there and talked to the uh, native people was that if you attack someone and kill them, you had to mutilate the body. There's no question of that because the body or spirit would get up and then pursue you. Yeah. That was a firm belief. And so uh, I mentioned in the book that they, they would have just hacked into the bodies, broken the long bones, broken the arm bones, all the rest of it. That's all that damage was. Nothing to do with cannibalism. Yeah. Oh, and, and don't forget, of course, the other thing is there was 40 pounds of chocolate in one of the boats when it was <laughs> yeah, about 10 good. years later. 40 <laughs> pounds of chocolate? That's a lot of chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it keeps, of course, and so on. So, um, just to uh, just for us to to round this off, what what is your next project? I mean, we've we've focused obviously on this book because it's an it's your new one, and we want to make sure that um, you know people track it down and read it. But any any more visits to the Arctic, um, or are you are you headed in a dif- different direction um, with uh, your? No, I'm uh, I'm eighty next month. And the idea that right. uh, I can right. get back up and try and do that again, I think, right. is remote. I I like puzzles. And uh, one is, the well, first one is, why why do we have an RAF? What's, what are they, what are they needed for? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this day and age... Um, and it was really a bad mistake uh, taking the aeroplanes from the army, taking the aeroplanes from the navy, and, and creating, and the, here's the word, independent force. That's the first title they were given. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's one of the projects. Another project is um, I've discovered who Jack the Ripper is. Oh, boy. Oh, right. There is now, now I can't tell you anything. Don't tell us now. Don't yeah. tell us. Now. Not yet. Um, I've got about what thirty thousand words down at the moment, right. and uh, so it's you're... an extraordinary story. <laughs> the, the he was a very famous man of his time. All right. Yeah. We should probably leave it at that because otherwise, you know, if you're going to write this book, if you tell us now, yeah, you've got to present the case in its whole. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> that sounds like a, an, an intriguing potential read, um, which uh, which which I will certainly and it, and 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 I'm sure Chris too will yeah. will be. Quite interested to see how that one goes, but for now, um, Chris, do you want to re- re- remind our listeners uh, about the book and where they can find it and so on? 
Uh, yeah, it is called uh, No Earthly Pole. It's by Ernest Coleman, and you can get it from all good bookshops, uh, including the online one that goes towards uh, sending someone to space. But we're also going to whack it onto the History Hack bookshop as well, so that Ernest gets a bit more of the money, we get a little bit of money, and uh, we're not going to waste it on rocket fuel. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's money it means the kids can eat now. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Or I might convince, try and convince Alex to uh, put the money towards us going to the Cocos Islands to look at the wreck of the Emden, and uh, so I can write about that. It's a lot warmer in the Cocos Islands than it is in uh, the Arctic. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoy this. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you very much Amy. for coming on History Hack today and uh, and and telling us uh, telling us about your own travels and uh, and and your work in terms of uh, unpicking the puzzle of the Franklin expedition and what happened in the end. Thank you very much indeed, again, for inviting me. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.